All right, my, my task was to uh, talk about surgical management. And, and actually, talking about surgical management takes minimum, as, as you found out from Dr. Sh uh, Shetty's, from Dr. Pra <coughs> Sharma's talk, it takes a long time <laughs> to cover them all thoroughly. So, uh, take in my lecture of that topic, it's about an hour to talk about the treatment and about 45 minutes to talk about the surgical treatment. So, I elected, actually, and it supplements uh, with Dr., uh, we, what we just heard, uh, to talk about the a little more complicated ones and kind of teach you a way of thinking to treat some of these patients. And again, some of this was alluded to already in Dr. Sharma's presentation. Again, I have no financial or intellectual conflict of interest to disclose in this case. Nystagmus is an oscillation of one or both eyes around one or more axes, <coughs> resulting in decreased vision. And more importantly for our presentation today, <coughs> anomalous head posture from compensation or null point. And most of the useful treatments, I think, are to correct for the uh, null point nystagmus. I think, as, as we just heard, the treatments that have been described for vision improvement and such are relatively ineffective, and if they are effective, it's for, for a relatively short time. Uh, the etiologies are infantile nystagmus syndrome, which is a benign condition, sensory, neurologic, or pharmacologic. So there's a number of etiologies. And the goals of nystagmus management are to maximize the useful vision, reduce oscillopsia when it's present, correct unacceptable head position, and correct any strabismus. And we're going to talk primarily now about these last two. And again, some of this was uh, already discussed uh, by Dr. Sharma. I think it's, it's well known, and, and he also mentioned, that the Kessenbaum-Anderson procedure is a well-described and a very effective procedure for treating routine no point in nystagmus or non nystagmus compensation syndrome. Um, and again, he mentioned that as well. The, the way of thinking about this is uh, that I like is <coughs> when you think about a patient turning their head to the left or to the right, if you turn your head to, to the left, then, then your left eye is ET and your right eye is XT. So you've got an ETI and an XTI. And he alluded to that as well. And so you can design a table like this, which talks you, tells you how to treat the ETI and the XTI. A key pearl here is that the ETI, the adducting eye, is almost always the dominant eye, the fixing eye. And that's going to be important when we talk about correcting uh, head posture. Uh, again, the numbers here, this is from my table, uh, from my atlas. Um, it's also, of course, available in, in, in Dr. Sharma's uh, new book as well. This is a bit older, but I still use it. Uh, it starts with the uh, Park straight flush 5678 numbers which have been found to be uh, ineffective in larger deviations. And uh, again, it builds with augmentation based on that. And these numbers have been very useful for me. And you can even uh, extrapolate in between. So for 20 to 25 diopter, 25 degrees, you can go uh, 5.75 medial rectus recession, for example. You can ex uh, extrapolate in between. <coughs> the results with Kessemon Anderson, in my experience, uh, we're looking at this 10-year period. One of our fellows reviewed our data, and we had uh, excellent results. Uh, no point nystagmus alone, uh, with less than 10-degree residual phase turn after treatment, with one procedure, 88%, with two procedures, 97%. And if they had nystagmus plus strabismus, we were able to get an excellent head posture and monofixation in 85%. Interestingly, these patients have very good fusion, even though they don't have the best visual acuity. Uh, and that really helps us. Uh, it's much less common to create nystagmus with, I mean, to create strabismus with these procedures, which you might expect when you're doing these very large recessions and resections, you'd get some asymmetry, but you don't. They tend to be able to fuse it. So again, the straight flush, six, seven, eight, uh, five, six, seven, eight ratio for surgical size results in minimal new strabismus or loss of binocularity, as we see here uh, in 116 patients that we did, uh, <coughs> uh, we had very, very little uh, complication risk. So again, this is a procedure that's very useful. But what I want to emphasize is the treatment of complex cases. I think we've kind of covered the simple cases. Um, but what about reoperation? If you have an anomalous head posture following previous Kestenbaum procedure, how do we deal with that? And he alluded to that as well. Uh, Reoperation for anomalous head posture following previous strabismus surgery, which isn't uncommon. Patients have 
service with surgery when they're younger and then they need uh, anomalous head posture compensation surgery later. And how do you modify uh, for com combined strabismus and anomalous head posture? I want to talk about a way to think about this so you can, in each individual patient, plan surgical muscles and surgical uh, dosage. So first, the issues to consider, the size and direction of residual or recurrent head posture, that's important. <coughs> As he mentioned, you want to measure that with a goniometer. You don't want to estimate. You almost always estimate a larger number than when you actually measure it with a goniometer or, or uh, something like that. If you look at a patient, you'll see it's a 35 or 45 degree face turn. And when you actually measure it, it'll be 20 or 25. The type of previous surgery performed is going to be important. Where are the muscles now? And sometimes you'll have to explore the patients to find that out. Again, this was alluded to uh, by Dr. Sharma. Um, you can't trust op notes, you can't trust what the patient said, you sometimes have to explore. The presence or absence of associated strabismus is important, and the dominant or fixing eye, and that's almost always going to be the adducting eye. Then you quantitate the posture at distance and near, using a small accommodated target, the goniometer, as we mentioned. You determine the ETI and the XTI, if it's a horizontal posture, and then you determine if strabismus is present. So you want to do all these in a stepwise fashion, uh, very completely and record all this data to plan properly. <coughs> Remember again that the dominant eye, the fixing eye, which is usually the adducting eye, determines the head position. So you must move that in the correct direction. And you can test this in advance with a prism. Put a prism over the dominant eye to move the eye in the right direction and you can see if the head posture improves. You cannot correct head posture by working on the non-dominant eye. And you may make the strabismus worse by doing this if they have strabismus as well. Then you correct the strabismus with the non-fixing eye. And again, this was alluded to earlier. So the key concept, successful surgery generally uh, must result in mechanical or motor limitation abductions and versions to near or just past the midline. You, I find you have to do pretty big surgeries to fix these for any length of time. Again, you'll get short-term results with, at least in my hands, with just recessions alone in most of them. Uh, I really do have to add that resection so that I prevent that eye from uh, moving past the midline very far. And I use force suctions in the OR to determine that, to, to convince myself that this is restricted to that point, and then I think I get the best results. When reoperating, I want to maintain that 5, 6, 7, 8 ratio when re-recessing and re-resecting or advancing muscles. Again, this maintains the good alignment, helps to prevent the inducing of strabismus, which is much more likely when you're doing reoperations. Uh, you can consider additional re-resection in both eyes in almost any patient, even if maximal resection has been done on the uh, antagonist muscle. So keep that in mind. You can almost always resect a muscle an additional five or six millimeters um, on each eye uh, at the appropriate ratio to uh, correct if there's a residual uh, head posture. And again, I use passive force suctions to gauge the surgical size for resection during reoperation. <coughs> so we'll close with a few cases to kind of illustrate how we think. So this is an operation for combined anomalous head posture and strabismus. Uh, this is a 58-year-old woman who had d dense monocular infantile cataracts in the left eye uh, with a deprivation of amblyopia. She had manifest latent nystagmus with a null point in left gaze, and she had increasing esotropia for the past 10 years. And, and here we are uh, showing her preoperatively. She's got 20-25 vision in the right eye, and she's got light perception vision in the left eye. She has a 25-degree right face turn. She fixates with the right eye in adduction. Again, as, as we said, the fixing eye is almost always the adducting eye. Uh, but in addition to that, she has a left esotropy of 45 to 50 prism diopters and a left hypotropy of 8 prism diopters. So how can we think about this kind of a case to decide what to do next? And finally, she's got decreased abduction of the left eye, as we see in the bottom picture. And again, that's from probably contracture of the left rectus from that long-term esotropia. <coughs> so she's a case of a right face turn of 25 degrees with an esotropy of 45 to 50 prism diopters and left hypotropy of 8 prism diopters. And again, she prefers that right eye in adduction. So the fixing eye is the right eye. So we have to use surgery on the right eye to straighten the head 
surgery on the left eye to correct the strabismus. So what's our plan? <clears throat> for a 25 degree right face turn, using my table for Kesselbaum Anderson procedure, I would perform the surgeries you see here. Uh, the uh, right medial rectus resection and l right lateral rectus resection, and these these on the procedures on the left eye. We need to do the full surgery on that right eye because that's the dominant fixing eye. That's what's going to control the head position. So I've got to do this full surgery. I can't correct the esotropia with the right eye. I have to correct the esotropia with the left eye. So now for an esotropia, <coughs> a 50 prism diopters and left hypotropia, uh, of eight prism diopters, my numbers, I would recess the left medial rectus seven, resects to the left lateral rectus nine, and superplace both of them eight millimeters, um, or about three quarters of a tendon width. That's my surgery for that strabismus. And what we can do now is the left eye surgery, we can add the two together. This is the Kestenbaum we would want to do. Then we can add the strabismus correction, and we end up with a recession of the left medial rectus of zero millimeters, resection of the left lateral rectus of one millimeter, and superplacement of both eight millimeters. So again, this is how we can add correction for strabismus along with correction for um, previous surgery or correction for uh, anomalous for a, um, a null point in the same in the same surgery. So again, this is a way to think about it that's very easy to do and very effective. And here we are postoperatively. She has no more anomalous head posture. She has only a flick exotropia at near and a small intermittent next at distance and she's an extremely happy patient. So again, I hope that this was helpful at, uh, at uh, <clears throat> kind of considering how to deal with these patients. So again, in conclusion, repeat Kessenbaum Anderson procedure is safe and effective for recurrent anomalous head postures uh, and also can be treated, used along with a strabismus surgery. Again, the dominant eye has to have the Kessenbaum numbers, Anderson numbers the uh, other eye is used to correct the strabismus. It's important to maintain that five, six, seven, eight ratio. Overcorrections are very rare. I rarely see the eyes uh, shift. We did here. I, I have seen a couple cases like the ones Dr. Sharma mentioned, uh, and some of them certainly could be PAN that's just missed. Although I've watched some of them for quite a long time, I really think that most patients with a null point have actually two null points. They have one null point here, and they have another null point 180 degrees away. And normally they can only get to one null point, which is why they turn their head a, a, a particular way. When you do surgery for that, sometimes I think they can switch to the other null point and you'll see the head switch to the opposite direction. I don't know if Dr. Sharma or anyone else would agree with that, but again, very uncommon. I've, I've seen two or three patients in 35 years of doing this kind of surgery. Um, so it's very unusual to overcorrect these. And there's also often also a slight uh, drift back, there's a slight recurrence over time, so again, it's very valuable to really restrict the muscles. Correct the dominant eye for the head posture, adjust the other eye for strabismus, and the reoperations can be customized based on the, the patient's clinical findings. Thank you.